This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 42. Coming up on Space Time. Two sizable Mars quakes detected on the red planet. Could red dwarf exoplanets harbour life after all? And Moscow's Big Lift, launching 38 satellites from 18 countries on one rocket. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's InSight lander has just detected two significant mass quakes on the red planet. The magnitude 3.3 and 3.1 tremblers were detected on March the 7th and 18th and originated from a region known as the Cerberus Fossae. This is the same region which recorded two strong quakes of magnitude 3.6 and 3.5 one Martian year or two Earth years earlier, suggesting the area is seismically active. Insights recorded well over 500 Mars quakes to date, but because of their clear signals, these four are the best quake records for probing the interior of the red planet. Studying Mars quakes is one way the Insight science team seeks to develop a better understanding of the Martian mantle and core. See, unlike Earth, Mars doesn't have tectonic plates, but it does have volcanically active regions which can cause rumbles. The latest quakes add weight to the idea that Cerberus Fossae is a centre of seismic activity. But whether it's real volcanism or simply the red planet shrinking as it cools is yet to be determined. InSight scientists have detected two different types of seismic activity on Mars, one similar to earthquakes with waves travelling more directly through the planet and the other more like moonquakes, which tend to be very scattered. Mars quakes usually fall somewhere between these two. But all four of these larger events from Cerberus Fossae were more like earthquakes. Interestingly, like the two earlier quakes, these new ones occurred during the Martian northern summer. Scientists had predicted this would be a great time to listen for Mars quakes because the winds are calmer this time of year on the red planet. See, although it's protected under a dome-shaped shield, InSight's seismometer still picks up the vibration from the wind, and that can be enough to obscure some Mars quakes. In fact, during the past northern Martian winter season, InSight couldn't detect any quakes at all. This is space time. Still to come, could red dwarf exoplanets harbour life after all? And Moscow's big lift, launching 38 satellites from 18 countries on a single rocket. All that and more still to come on space time. A new study claims scientists shouldn't be so quick to rule out the possibility of life on Earth-like exoplanets orbiting in the habitable zones of red dwarf stars. Red dwarfs are by far the most common type of star in the Milky Way galaxy, and astronomers are detecting huge numbers of exoplanets in orbit around them. That's because they're easier to spot around red dwarfs than around brighter, more luminous stars but they're usually overlooked in science's ongoing search for extraterrestrial life because they're expected to be barren, lifeless worlds. See, although red dwarfs are far smaller and cooler than the sun, they exhibit far higher levels of stellar flare activity. And that results in a dramatically increased level of irradiation of any planet in the habitable zone, the region around a star where temperatures would allow liquid water, essential for life as we know it, to exist on the planet's surface. That intense stellar flare and wind activity wouldn't just bathe the surface in radiation, it would also blow any atmosphere away. A good example is the detection of the Earth-like planet Proxima b, orbiting in the habitable zone around the star Proxima Centauri, which just happens to be the nearest star to the Sun. That raised great excitement, though it was pointed out that Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf. Proxima b is only 4.24 light years away, making it the nearest known exoplanet to Earth. But it receives some 250 times more X ray radiation than the Earth and experiences deadly levels of ultraviolet radiation on its surface. End of story. Well, not necessarily. 
A new study reported in the monthly notices the Royal Astronomical Society claims rocky Earth-like planets orbiting red dwarfs shouldn't be dismissed as possible or potential hosts of life. Astronomers Lisa Kaltenegger and Jack O'Malley-James from Cornell University claim that planet Earth is proof that life can survive the sort of radiation bombardment expected from orbiting a red dwarf. They claim that all life on Earth today evolved from creatures that thrive during even greater ultraviolet radiation assault than Proxima b and other nearby exoplanets are currently enduring. They point out that 4 billion years ago, planet Earth was also a chaotic, irradiated hot mess. Yet despite this, life somehow gained a foothold and then expanded. Of course, all this depends on when life first began on Earth. The earliest confirmed life forms on Earth are fossilized stromatolite bacteria microorganisms, which were found in 3.456 billion year old Australian Pilbara Craton Apex chert rocks. Now, there are some mineral signatures in even older rocks, stromatolites also found in Western Australia, dating back to some 3.7 billion years, and possibly even earlier samples from Greenland. Kaltenegger and O'Malley James claim, just as on early Earth, the same thing could be happening now on nearby exoplanets. The authors model the surface ultraviolet environments of the four exoplanets closest to Earth that are potentially habitable, Proxima b, Trappist-1e, Ross-128b and LHS-1140b. These planets all orbit small red dwarf stars which, unlike our Sun, flare frequently, thereby bathing the planet's surfaces in high-energy ultraviolet radiation. While it's unknown exactly what conditions prevail on the surfaces of the worlds orbiting these flare stars, it is known that such flares are biologically damaging and can cause the erosion of planetary atmospheres. High levels of radiation cause biological molecules like nucleic acids to mutate and even shut down. The authors modelled various atmospheric compositions, from ones similar to present-day Earth, through to eroded and anoxic atmospheres, those with very thin atmospheres that don't block ultraviolet radiation, as well as those without the protection of ozone. The models show that as the atmosphere thins and ozone level decreases, more high-energy ultraviolet radiation reaches the surface. The researchers then compared their models to Earth's early history, starting nearly 4 billion years ago, going through to today. Although the model planets receive higher ultraviolet radiation than that emitted by our Sun today, this is significantly lower than what the Earth received 3.9 billion years ago. Kaltenegger says that given that the early Earth was inhabited, ultraviolet radiation should not be a limiting factor for the habitability of planets orbiting red dwarfs. She says that means these neighbouring exoplanetary worlds should remain intriguing targets in the search for life beyond our solar system. We live in this amazing time where we found thousands of other planets, planets that don't orbit our own sun, but other suns, other stars that you can see in the night sky. And the next one over after our sun is actually a small red star called Proxima Centauri. And even the next star in only four light years away has a planet that could potentially be like an Earth at the right distance, so it's not too hot and not too cold for there to be liquid surface water. So the big question that arose when looking at this young red sun is whether the harsh UV radiation that it flings out at its planet would actually be detrimental to life starting to evolve there. And what we figured out is when we calculated how much of this harsh UV radiation would make it to the ground on that planet, is that it would be worse than currently on Earth. So for you and me, it wouldn't be the best place to be, but it's less than it was on a young Earth. And on a young Earth, we had life. So the chances to finding life close to us, around the closest stars that happen to be red young suns, is much greater now. And so our quest, to figure out whether we're alone in the universe just got a tiny bit easier. That's Lisa Kaltenegger from Cornell University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, Moscow's big lift launching 38 satellites on a single rocket and later in the science report, taking another look at the Australian COVID-19 vaccine developed by the University of Queensland. All that and more still to come 
on Space Time. Russia has successfully carried out a big lift, placing no less than 38 satellites from 18 different countries into orbit. The Soyuz 2-1A, equipped with a frigate upper stage, launched under leaden morning skies from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The mission had been delayed by several days due to technical issues following detection of a voltage surge. The Russian Federal Space Agency at Roscosmos says the 38 satellites in the manifest included payloads from South Korea, Japan, Canada, Saudi Arabia, Germany, Italy, Brazil, and the first satellite completely made locally in Tunisia. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study has called for researchers to take another look at an Australian COVID-19 vaccine developed by the University of Queensland. The vaccine looked promising, but was abandoned because of concerns that it was creating false positive readings in HIV tests. But a report in the Journal of Clinical and Transitional Immunology says data from trials shows the vaccine was providing good COVID-19 protection after just a single dose and was stable at normal refrigeration temperatures. The authors say this shows that the underlying platform worked well and that it may be worth re-engineering the vaccine to avoid the false positive HIV issue. Almost 3 million people have now died from the COVID-19 virus, and another 135 million have been infected since the deadly disease first emerged from China and spread around the world. A new study has found that waters of southern New South Wales and the eastern coast of Tasmania are warming twice as fast as waters off northern New South Wales and more than three times faster than the global average. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, are based on an analysis of a quarter of a century of Pacific coastal water data adjacent to the East Australian current. The world's oceans are warming at an average rate of 0.12 degrees Celsius per decade. Scientists from the University of New South Wales found that coastal waters off Coffs Harbour on the New South Wales north coast are warming at 0.16 degrees Celsius per decade, while those off North Stradbroke Island are warming at 0.22 degrees per decade. And the news is even worse further south. It seems waters off Tasmania's Maria Island are now warming at an incredible 0.41 degrees per decade and those off Sydney and Naruma on the New South Wales central and south coasts are now warming at a blistering 0.48 degrees Celsius per decade. What this means is that Pacific Ocean off the New South Wales coast has warmed by an average of around 1.5 degrees over the past 30 years. And those numbers are accelerating, with initial readings of southern New South Wales this year showing water temperatures a shocking 4 degrees above average. A new study warns that less than one-fifth of the African elephant habitat now remains. Around 18 million square kilometres of Africa is suitable habitat for elephants. But human pressure and the evil ivory trade has shrunk their actual range down to just 17% of this. A report in the journal Current Biology found 62% of the entire African continent to be suitable. But GPS tracking of 229 elephants over 15 years showed the animals stick to a far smaller home range. Making matters worse, over half of the current range of these elephants was outside protected areas, highlighting the limited safe space available. Well, they say men come from Mars and women from Venus, but a new study suggests that when it comes to how their brains differ, the answer seems to be very little. A report in the journal Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews has for the first time coalesced a wide range of studies comparing male and female human brains. The authors found that while male and female brains do differ slightly, these distinctions are due mainly to brain size, not sex or gender. Researchers found actual sex differences in the brain are tiny and inconsistent once individual head sizes are accounted for. See, on average, female brains are about 11% smaller than males' brains, but that's in proportion to their body size. 
and smaller brains allow certain features, such as a slightly higher ratio of grey matter to white matter and a higher ratio of connections between versus within cerebral hemispheres. All this means that brain differences between large and small-headed males are just as great as brain differences between the average male and female. And importantly, none of these size-related differences can account for familiar behavioural differences between men and women, such as empathy or spatial skills. The handful of features that do differ most reliably are quite small in magnitude, such as the volume of the amygdala, an olive-sized part of the temporal lobe that is important for social-emotional behaviours, which is about 1% larger in males. The study also rebukes the long-standing view that males' brains are more lateralized, meaning each hemisphere acts independently, whereas the two hemispheres in female brains are said to be better connected and operate more in sync with each other. Such a difference could make males more vulnerable to disability following brain injury such as stroke. But here again, the consensus shows that any differences are extremely small, accounting for less than 1% of the range of left-right connectivity across the population. Put simply, the study found that there are no universal species-wide brain features that differ between the sexes. Rather, the brain is just like any other organ, such as the heart and kidneys, which are similar enough to be transplanted between men and women quite successfully. All of which, I guess, is proof that men really can drive just as well as women and on both sides of the road. The mystery of New Zealand's Canterbury Plains Panther may finally have been solved. And in case you're wondering, yes, it's just a big domestic cat. As Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics reports, the legend of the Canterbury Plains Panther dates back decades, even longer, with claims of a large escaped lion-like creature on the loose. Every country seems to have its panther story, the big cats. And in the Canterbury area of New Zealand, which is around the Christchurch area, they have had sightings over the years of supposed big cats. And I mean, over the years, I mean, sort of about the last century, all sorts of explanations given. People who see it, swear it was huge. They tend to have seen it from a long way away. A very long-lived cat. A very long-lived cat. Well, the whole trouble is, the thing is, no one's quite sure where they supposedly came from in the first place. There was one story suggesting that a cat had escaped from a crate being unloaded in a ship in the start of last century. Now, you need at least two. I don't know many um, cats that can breed on their own. And you need actually more than ah, two. Maybe actually, it was already pregnant. Maybe it was already pregnant. But even so, you do need a lot of numbers to actually maintain. Uh, I don't know how many... Uh, kittens, uh, panthers have it at any one time, but uh, you need a fair number to actually maintain a, a decent breeding population. And when you have a decent number, you should be seeing a lot of them. Well, you're not seeing a lot of them here. People are seeing lone, large cats. And someone caught one. Someone, I think he shot it. And it's fairly large. It's not like a big, big cat. It's not like a, a panther or a tiger or anything like that. It looks like a big cat. So we're talking Maine <laughs> coon size, not lion, tiger, leopard size. That's right, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and he sent some of the, the hair off. I think it was hair. He's uh, sent it off to be DNA tested and the DNA test came back and lo and behold it's a cat <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty much a domestic cat that's yeah, got out and got, got feral yeah, yeah gone, gone feral and nothing like a panther or a tiger or anything like that they're big feral, feral cats can get big they're not as big as tigers and things but they can get uh, pretty big especially when they're interbreeding and all sorts of things like that so yeah from a distance they can look like uh, large animals but they very rarely get caught very rarely get photographed in fact and this one was caught and they sent it off and it turned out to be a cat. That one out and the suggestion might be, well, maybe they're all cats, just ordinary cats. And you think? Probably a pretty fair assumption, actually. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 